Alright, so, um, speed up your style is <laughs> what got me excited about this uh, presentation. So we all know that browsers are evolving uh, constantly. What was, you know, good practices in 2013 is not good practices anymore, or, you know, has changed a little bit. So because browsers are evolving, you also have to kind of keep uh, up to speed and keep uh, changing what those criteria that made for good performance work in the client and browser side. Uh, so you have to read a lot, you have to be aware a lot, you have to follow those industry leaders that we all know of, and you have to keep playing to see what fit, suits and fits your needs. Um, so these are a few of my favorite things for performance. <laughs> That's my favorite thing for life. <laughs> but I, so I'm just going to focus, instead of like going all over the place, I'm going to focus on SVGs, uh, inline images or data URIs, uh, progressive JPEGs, uh, optimizing true CSS properties, or you know when not to use CSS properties, like uh, we can get to that later. And about CSS selectors, you know what can cause bloat, what won't. Um, so the first thing, SVGs, they're great. Uh, if you're using like you know logos in your site, who doesn't? You want to use SVGs. They're scalable. You know they're smaller than PNGs. Um, you can gz them, make them smaller. You can optimize them, make them even smaller. Um, but the thing is that because an SVG, a standard vector graphic, is basically an XML-like document, it has a DOM-like element, so you can use JavaScript to kind of manipulate that, which is what you know you end up doing in D3JS. Uh, you can write styles for it if you give classes to your uh, you know SVG, and you know you can also run media queries on SVG. So if you want to like have an SVG show differently on a mobile device versus a desktop browser, you can do that. Um, so I wrote a very simple test for uh, SVGs. I just used a, a logo and wrote, let's see, right. So this is a very simple um, HTML file where I use um, that here, guy and use an SVG like so and have it display. So, oh, the other good thing is that on Retina displays, the SVG just shows up better. Um, and it's smaller. So I ran a quick test um, on one of my browsers, which I have on this guy. So if you'll notice that there's basically just two calls on my page. One is the HTML itself. The other is, um, the HTML here. Uh, SVG is like tr takes about three milliseconds. The PNG takes about four milliseconds. So this seems like a small amount on uh, on just the one page with the one logo. Over time, it becomes you know a big uh, a big gain for a site that wants to be really performant. So the reason I ended up using this is because of this site, which was all parallax. It's the mobile version of HBO.com, not the mobile, the iPad version of HBO.com. And all these guys, this guy, that guy, that guy, that guy, because it's going to be seen on retina devices, you want it to look really clear and sharp. So those are all SVGs. And it also means that because Parallax is such a heavy uh, load on your site, you're basically saving some few kilobytes and some few uh, milliseconds on loading this guy. Um, all right, let's go back to the presentation. So that's just the comparison that we just saw. Uh, you get bonus points, of course. So apart from just having smaller uh, files of smaller sizes, you can optimize the SVG a little more. A typical SVG, when you generate it using Illustrator, would look like would look like this. A lot of crap, right? We don't need comments. We don't need all of that. You kind of clean that up either by hand or there's tools that can automate that process for you. There in my slide, I'll share that with you later. But you clean up the white space, you clean up the comments, you get a smaller file, and win. All right. And then, of course, IE8 does not support it. Every other browser does. You can polyfill it using modernizer and just uh, replace the SVG with a, with a PNG on IE8. Um, so like I said, they're great for icons, logos, maps. They scale really well if you have a large image on your uh, browser. So like Google Maps or whatever, you can use like an SVG to do that really well. But if you want to be redrawing it, because the SVG is being rendered on the browser site and it's drawing it, you don't want to kind of use it in video games. You're better off using something like Canvas. Um, all right. 
inline CSS images. So that's the other way you can um, reduce your page load. So one of the key things that bottlenecks of pages, you know, the requests that go out for resources and assets and CSS. If you use data URIs, which is basically converting your binary image into a base64 code and then embedding it in the CSS, you're going to make one less request. Um, looks something like this. So this is a normal uh, background image being used. If you were to use a uh, uh, an inline image in the CSS, it would just basically be this. Again, you have tools online. If you you know look up base64 and code it, images you can just get that. You you know upload your PNG, get this, and place this here. Um, and again, there's a there's a good uh, performance benefit. So I ran another test, and in this case you had uh, this is the regular PNG. And in this case, you had two resources, you know, three milliseconds each. In that case, because the HTML is gzipped and is smaller, it kind of compares with the original HTML that had the, the PNG. And uh, there's no cost for, for the, the PNG itself because it's embedded. All right. And the other good, really good thing is that because the image is going to be in your CSS, CSS is going to be cached. You can set long expires on your CSS, so you're going to basically keep that CSS for two days, three days in a browser, and it's just going to use whatever is in that CSS, so that makes it even faster. Um, this actually works in IE, which is great, and it's great for desktop browsers. Last year, someone from Mobify uh, came up with a blog where they tested, ran some tests on using data URIs in mobile mm -hmm. devices, and it seems like... Uh, mobile devices are not there yet. When they have to actually decode that image, the base64 image, and paint it again, they take a, the hit in, uh, you know, processor, in processing and uh, battery too. So for now, maybe we're not ready for mobile devices. Uh, progressive JPEGs have been talked a lot. Um, it's almost like going back to the old days of the internet, but it's kind of great because as a user, you see something and you're not left with a blank image. Um, progressive JPEGs basically means that instead of saving your JPEG as a normal JPEG, you save it as a progressive JPEG in Photoshop or whatever tool you use. It's a little bigger than your baseline JPEG, which is your normal JPEG ruling the internet right now. Um, but but like uh, Stoyan Sefanov says, if your sizes, uh, the size of your file is above 10K, then it's not that big of a difference. Um, he also says because the ratio with which the progressive JPEG is bigger than the baseline JPEG is only a little bit, you're kind of always better off giving the user the illusion of having some, something there instead of like the content jumping when the image is done loading. Um, again, desktop browsers, the support's kind of there, especially with Chrome. Mobile, we're not there yet. Wait a bit. Optimizing CSS selectors. For people who like Portlandia, woo. No use optimizing CSS selectors anymore. So we used to all, you know, kind of keep our selectors uh, less bulky. And um, last year, you know, Paul Irish, you can't have a presentation without a Paul Irish tweet, announced that you don't really have to worry about selected performance anymore because you're doing more harm than good, you know, maybe sacrificing readability for performance. And because browsers are so fast now, when they calculate uh, selectors, it's, it's we're good to go. Um, and to that extent, uh, Chrome DevTools used to have a CSS profiler where you could see how much you know, was being called for each style, how much selector was being called for each uh, style. They don't have that anymore. They removed it as of last year. Uh, a better way to maybe, uh, you know, have your CSS be reduced is to just remove all unused CSS. There's enough tools there um, on GitHub. People have repos. There's ways you can kind of run your code and see what part of the CSS is being used and what isn't. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is CSS properties. Love them, right? Who doesn't? You can just use radial gradients, linear gradients um, instead of images. But you have to know when you're using CSS3 properties like box shadows, like uh, you know border radiuses, those pretty borders on your buttons, they do take a hit. Not on the load itself, but on the painting. When you're painting the page with those special properties, it might um, you know slow down your page while painting a bit. Especially if some of them are used together. Like if you use border radius and a shadow on a button, just gonna bring down 
uh, the, the way the page paints. But it's still better than using images. And with that, this talk is over. Thank you. Just have a few links there if you guys want to go through them. These are the tools I was talking about for you know encoding, for you know removing your CSS, for uh, you know knowing your browser. This is really important because this is a great like 30-minute video that talks about everything from how the browser first gets the request to rendering, painting, layout. So, thank you. Do you have any questions? Oh, right, questions. <laughs> I don't know if you want to questions. Really, guys, questions? We just had pizza. Sort of the point of the blue screen. <laughs> right, right. Um, they probably should, right? I mean, feel free to uh, not agree with me, but if if you kind of take the SVG code and put it on your HTML, if right, it's hard to get email. It's hard to get email clients to even get anything beyond HTML four, so support for SVG seems unlikely. But SVG has been around since forever. It's not like a new. Yeah, and X but and what is you? What is usable inside of the old Outlooks? So like Outlook right, you know, Outlook will today, not work with person, anything. Person oh, and HTML four has been around yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You can't even get HTML four. Right. right. Not, tables. Use tables, tables for emails. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Email performance. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Throw those emails out millions at a time. <laughs> what other questions? How's the pizza? <laughs> <laughs> Not a question, but a, a comment. It would be interesting to see for the image data URL to use uh, SVG instead of HTML. Oh, that's actually a good point. I forgot to mention that, but in the HBO website, it's actually an SVG that's oh, been used yeah. as a data URL. So, so it's the best. Yeah, it's the two, the best of the you know, both the worlds together. Good point. That's that's also true. Sure it can just be an XML. Yeah. Uh, so So that's true, but because you embed it and because you gzip your CSS, yeah. there's like a 3% difference between your CSS with the PNG versus the CSS with the, the base 64 encoding. So a non-gzip version is still 6% difference? It's a little bigger. Like in my case, the difference was a few bytes because I, I had a very tiny HTML. Mathematically, you're going from uh, 120 to 64-bit set to approximately 30% larger. That's true. You say one that, and the big the big performance hit for B sixty four is just that the browser is going to have to decode it instead of just showing the image. So you might want to hold off on using them on mobile devices. That's true. So and then you have just one logo, which you know you can have extra text in your logo, use media queries. Right. And your sprite could for all you care be a data URI too. Just put one rule for the image. Yeah. Yeah.